technologies. We manufacture a unique line of mobility-enabling mobility tools for people with movement disorders. This is a training video on one of those pieces of equipment called the Bungie Mobility Trainer, or BMT. All our products have the same theme. They create unique environments where people can practice a functional task over and over and over when normally it would be either impossible or unsafe to do so. And this is in line with the current evidence in physical medicine that says that the best outcomes come from training that's both functional and intense. Today we're going to show you what functional and intense looks like for people with serious movement disorders. We've seen great outcomes with these tools in a variety of settings, whether that be reduced stay days and subacute rehab, or positive changes to a care plan in long-term care, going from a two-person to a one-person, or a one-person to an independent transfer. The Bungie Mobility Trainer is a balanced training environment with variable body weight support. The goal with this piece of equipment is to give patients the strength, balance, and coordination required to safely interact in the real world. In other words, to support themselves with their lower extremities. You'll see we'll work on automatizing protective reaction, which is a key skill. Oftentimes in the real world, people may have a walker, but either they don't use the walker properly, or they tend to rely on it too much, or they can't use it in rooms like the bathroom or in small rooms. So think of the bungee mobility trainer a little bit like aqua therapy without the water and the ability to vary the body weight support. So what we're going to do today is go through a generic training session. I'm going to just put a patient in the machine and take a patient out of the machine. And then I'm going to go through the various adjustments on the machine, some of the, the tricks in terms of getting people comfortable in the machine because that's a real a real issue is you have to make sure that they're comfortable. Uh, then I'm going to go through six different applications and then go through some of the contraindications at the end. Okay, so we're going to bring in a patient who will transfer in from a walker. And you'll see we always start with a seat very low. We're going to roll it up behind her, and then we're going to lock the walker. And we always lock the front wheels only. And you'll see why as I start to get through this. And it should be a one-person transfer, even for very large patients. So she's still in the walker. transfer her hands to the side. Remember, I'll go through all this later. I just wanted to show you where we're going. And then you unlock the walker. Go ahead and take a few steps back. A few steps forward. We're going to walk through this all again, but I just wanted to show you where we're going. And now to take her out, we're going to lock it again. Remember, you always lock the machine when you're taking the person in or out. Give her back her walker. Transfer her hands. Lock the walker, unhook, and then she's free to go. Okay, and it should only be about 30 seconds or so to put somebody in that. So let me go over the various parts of the equipment. And by the way, when you go through this video and I go through the different applications, stop it and try it with one therapist being the patient another therapist being the therapist, and then rotate around because you'll get better at doing this. All of the adjustment knobs are the same. They have two pieces to them. They have a large black knob and then a plunger. The large black knob should only be a half a turn one way or another. So I would turn a half a turn counterclockwise, pull out the plunger, and then change the position, and then it'll lock in. So you can, you can adjust the handlebars, you saw the locks. These are classic caster locks. You can do it with your hand or you can do it with your feet. There's four of them, but typically we only use the front ones, and I'll explain why a little bit later. There are extreme height post adjustments. And so you want this 
about at the top of the iliac crest. So right about, this is a little bit low for me, so three holes showing would be perfect for me. Don't worry too much about that, it's a rough rule of thumb. And it's easier if you have two people adjusting it, so you can do it, if you only have one person, you can do it from one side, you bring it up until it clicks, there's three holes, and bring it to the other side, and there's three holes. So you can do it on your own, but only one hole at a time. I'm going to put it back into two holes showing. This is the adjustment you'll use the most, and it adjusts the seat position. I'm going to move this, the machine sideways so you can see. When I pull out this knob and slide this slider assembly down, you'll see how the seat goes up. That takes more of the patient's body weight. Up, when you move it up, it takes less. Okay, and we'll go through that again. You can see there's seat belts on the side, so you buckle the person in. And we'll talk a little bit about seat positioning on this. You don't want the seat too high, or you don't want the seat too low. You want it on an angle about like that, and you control that angle with the length of those, with the tightness of those straps. Also, the legs come in and come out. There's a little black knot here. You can pull them in around both sides. They have two positions, um, straight ahead or 90 degrees out. It's not, you use it 90 degrees out usually when you put the patient in for the first time, but also if you're doing side to side movement. If you're just walking the person, taking them for a walk, then you can have the legs in. Okay? So that's a quick overview of the various adjustment knobs you have. And now we're going to put, we're going to put the patient back in, and I'll talk a little through the process to do that. Okay. So, come on back. And I'm going to roll this up. And you'll notice the seat is low, and the seat is low for a reason, because we want to make sure it's easy to get the pommel between your legs. I'm going to lock the front wheels only. Remember, whenever you're taking people in and out, it's always best to have the wheels locked. And then she's still holding onto her walker, and the walker's locked. And then I'm going to rotate the seat up and buckle her in. You'll notice she's still not in the machine. She's still supporting herself with her walker. Now in terms of patient selection for this, the patient has to be able to support his or her weight for 30 seconds to a minute. If she can't support her weight, she's not a candidate for this machine. She's better candidate for our sit to stand trainer and you can look on our website to see what that does. But this is really for patients who can support their weight. So we have her in this position. Now I told you that the seat was very low to start with. I'm going to bring it up so it just touches her behind. That's so that when she moves, the machine moves with her, but there's no body weight support at this time. So we're going to transfer the hands. We're going to move the walker out of the way. And you'll notice I always stay in front. So especially early on, our challenge is to make sure that the patient feels safe so that they'll try things they normally wouldn't try because that's how we improve. But if they're t always afraid of falling, it's very hard for them to step outside of their normal comfort zone. You'll notice I only locked the front. I did that so that when I start to work with her, I don't have to walk around to the back like this and unlock the back and leave her with no one in front. Because especially when we start, she wants to know that something's there. Because one of the challenges is there's nothing in front of her and she hasn't had nothing in front of her for a long time. We always try to keep the patient's hands at the back of the handlebars because these were designed long so that, so that the therapist can move the patient and manipulate them. So the first thing you have to do is teach the patient that they're safe. So what I want you to do is let yourself fall, okay, and then come on up, and do it again. You notice the, the wheels are locked and I'm in front of her. Now I'm going to ask her to take her hands off the handlebars. And this is important because patients have always supported themselves with their upper body. They waste a lot of energy holding on, and you want to dramatically illustrate to them that they don't need their upper body. They can use it, but that they don't need it. Okay, put your hands back up, and come on up. So now we're ready to actually start moving, and you'll notice I can unlock by just reaching across and staying in front of her the whole time and talking to her, making sure that she's okay and she's safe, etc., because she's going to be nervous, and that's understandable. 
So let's get her to take a few steps forward, okay, and then a few steps backwards. Now, if your floor is, this floor is high pile, low pile carpet, so it doesn't move quite as well. If you have that, you're going to have to help move her. If you're on a, tor a normal gym floor, hardwood floor, a linoleum floor, it rolls very nicely. So we did that a couple of up and back so she knows what it feels like. And now we want to take her through a fall. And this is really important. So we're going to say, we're going to go through a fall. So I'm going to be right with you the whole time. So take a few steps back. And now fall. That's a catastrophic fall right there. So come on forward. Let's try it again. OK, and go backwards and fall. So hopefully, at the end of this little period where you're getting comfortable, you can try to do this. Hold my hand, and then walk backwards, and fall. So that's what we're after. We're after to feel comfortable, for her to feel comfortable, so that we can start really doing some higher level training. So come on back up. OK, so we're going to go through six applications. The first one is going to be, it's more gait training. So this patient is hemiparetic on the right side. And so what we're going to do is take a bit of her weight. So remember I, I talked about, let me just block this for a second. I can put this back in front of her for a second while I do this. You put your hands on there. Okay. So what I'm going to do is take some of her body weight away. So you'll notice what I do is I put my right hand here, I pull out the pin and push down, and you'll see that the seat lifts up a bit. You see this rocker assembly here? It's on a bit of an angle upwards, and that shows there's a bit of body weight support. So the swimming pool analogy is now that she's, she's got a bit of buoyancy. Okay? And you'll see why in a second, because with her hemiparetic leg, she has trouble supporting. So what we're doing is we're taking a bit of the body weight away so she can actually take that step and stand on it. So put your hands back here. Okay. And the best place for you is right here on the therapy stool. And I can unlock the leg, stand in front of her, move that out of the way. So take this a couple steps back so we have a bit of a run at it. Okay, now remember you're affected this side, so you don't have that. So you're going to go ahead and step forward with your good leg. Okay, and now if she has trouble, I can facilitate right there. And step with this one, I can put the weight on the leg, leg, lock the knee, and then move her to the other one and facilitate here. Now, you can facilitate with a towel or with a strap as well, but you're able to get the patient to do things normally she couldn't. She would have great trouble doing that. If she couldn't do that, we could unweight her a little bit more. And so go ahead. Okay. So we can have her step, lock the knee, step, move, lock the knee. Okay. Now, a couple other things you can do with a hemiparetic patient. You could have her, have her do squats on the affected side. So let's go ahead and on your affected side, so on your right side, go ahead and do a one-legged squat. And then up. And down and then up. Okay? So you can do a lot of really functional things with her when normally she couldn't. Okay, so that's gait training. Now we're going to work on balance training. And so I'm going to lock the wheels. This back in the front, and I'm going to unweight her a little bit. I'm going to go back to the neutral position because this is more now an insurance policy in case she falls during some of these actions we're going to do. So put your hands back on there, roll this out of the way, and go back a little bit. Oops. Okay, now I'm going to give her a badminton racket. We're going to play balloon badminton. Okay, so let's start playing. Hmm? Oh, sorry, she's not a hemiparetic patient on the right side anymore. We magically cured her. Okay, now try doing it without holding on the other hand. That's it. Come on and move around. Okay. So that's the idea. Now you'll notice I'm always within the vicinity of the front of her, so I can always stop her. I'm close enough, but you can see what she can work on. And here's the trick. The science is that we want to distract her from her posture so that she automatizes protective reaction. There's a great study that took two groups of adults. One group was trained 
by being distracted. They balanced training by being distracted by a video game. The other group balanced, but they didn't have a video game. The first group got much better because they were forced to learn to automatize those steps. Because, as you know, one of the tricks is if you do catch yourself, most of us who, who function um, normally would be able to automatically take that step. But people with mobility problems have lost that ability just because they're afraid and haven't done it in a while. So, balloon badminton is a great one to use. The other one, which is so much fun with people of an older demographic, is waltzing. So we can get her in a perfect position to do a four-step waltz. So, step this way this way, this way, and then back. And she can stumble, she can fall, doesn't matter, okay? And so you're supporting her, so she's trying some things, she's getting into the dancing, she can't focus on her legs so much, and she can work on those protective skills. Or how about soccer? That's a great one. So we have a soccer ball, and she can hold on first, kicking back and forth, and then as she gets better, we can get her to let go with one hand. She has to go for it. Let go with both hands. And you'll notice that I'm never that far away. I'm always right in front. Okay? So soccer is a great fun activity that you can use. Or another one that works on one-legged stance and balance is this one. So hold your hands at your side and she's gonna she's gonna bounce the ball back to me with her leg. And walk forward, what are you doing? And go backwards. Okay. Or how about just a catch? A lot of the times, remember, they really want to hold on and you really want to encourage them to let go. So one of the ways of doing that is tossing the ball. So she has to catch it. Okay, she can fall, or we could bounce and throw it to her. Take a side step this way. Okay, and back. Back this way. Okay. Okay. So that's just bouncing a ball. We talked about one-legged stance or one-legged squats. So she could do one-legged squats as we showed you a second ago. Uh, the other one you can do is jumping. So you think, why would I want my patient to jump? If you could have the person actually jump and land safely, imagine how much safer they'll be when they're walking around at home and they stumble. So it looks like this. I'm going to give her a bit more body weight support on this because let's say she can't, and you'll notice again, to give body weight support, I slide this down. And so now I'm going to get in front of her, hold her arms, and let's go down and jump. Let's try it again. Stand up and go down and jump. One more time, down and jump. Okay? And she can slowly progress and do it maybe without holding on to me. Okay. The other uh, great application for OTs is being able to go to the sink and do some functional activities around a kitchen. So what we're going to do is modify it a bit so she can walk up to a kitchen counter. Okay, so your counter is behind you. She can walk up to a kitchen counter. She can reach up, grab a mug, okay, she could reach down into the stove, pick something out of the stove, a lot of great OT type applications that otherwise you'd be holding her with a therapy belt. And remember, the difference is, you, you could do this holding her with a therapy belt, the downside is twofold. Number one, now we need two clinicians. But from a science perspective, she's not feeling really what it's like to completely lose her weight, lose her balance. Because remember, you want, it, you want that person to feel what it's like to lose their balance for two reasons. Number one, so that when they lose it in the real world, they don't panic because they're used to falling in the, in the therapy clinic all the time. And number two, maybe they'll regain that automatic step, that automatic protect, protective reaction that could save their life. Okay, I'm going to put the machine back to its neutral position. And by the way, you can take these right out if you want to. And you could do so. So if you're really comfortable with a patient, you can take them out. And then you could do throwing a ball back and forth so she has less things around her to get in the way. The last application I want to walk through is, is um, 
picking things up off the floor. And for that, I want to introduce one other piece. So you'll notice a lot of people ask the question, what happens if they fall forward? So if they fall backwards, they fall sideways, they're fine. If they fall forward, two things. Number one, I'm going to be in front of them all the time. So if she started to fall forward, I would stop her here. If I was working gait training with her and she falls forward, I stop her here. And most people don't fall forward. Most people fall sideways or back. And then if they do, they put their hands here. That's typically what happens. If you'd like, you can put on this chest harness. And this chest harness is designed to make sure they never fall forward. But there's, there's a bit of a downside to this. First of all, it takes a few minutes to put it on, or a minute or so. But also, sometimes the patients don't feel as comfortable. So for example, if I had that tight, and go ahead and lean forward, she can't go anywhere. But it does restrict the movement. But it's a great tool for this application, and that's picking something up off the floor. So for this application, I'm going to drop the seat quite low. And let's say there's a badminton racket on the floor. Okay, so why don't you reach down, see if you can grab that. Okay. And try it again. And try it with, take your other hand off. Okay. She can do that slowly or not. I'm right here, but it's a great functional tool, a functional exercise of picking something up off the floor. Okay. The, the last one is step up and step over. I'm going to take off the harness for this one. So I hope you guys are pausing the video as we do this and trying it amongst yourselves. So let's go back. I'm just going to change the seat position so that it's a little bit higher. And it's going to be really high, and you'll see why in a second. I'm going to bring the arms up. Okay, and I'm going to bring in the therapy step. Now, this patient, let's say, is right side affected, so they're hemiplegic, right side affected. So now she's unweighted. So she can actually take a step with that affected leg up and over and back. I'm oh, sorry, up and over and up back and lead with the predator. Okay, and up. And if she couldn't do that, I would just take more of her weight. I would move the rock, move the slider, the, the bungee slider at the back, I'd move it down to take more of her weight. We can step it up one more, do it with our hands. Up, and over, and back, and back. Okay. And you're really only limited by your own imagination. All the things you would normally do for balance training, you can do it in this machine, but enables you to do it much more intensely. And also, as you can see, in a functional way. So we're just going to bring this up a bit. Okay. So I just want to show you again, taking the patient out once it's done. Oh, the last one you can do, you can have the person running if you like. Um, so if, you, if she was unweighted a bit, I'll just show you that. So I'm going to unweight her just a bit. I'd like you to just run on the spot. Put your hands here and just run on the spot. Okay. Then you can do it holding my hands. Okay. So you could imagine in a gym, I could be walking backwards with her. Okay, while she's running. Or normally she couldn't do that, but she's given that little body weight support that enables her to do it. Okay. So we're going to take her out of the machine. Put your hands up here. We're going to lock this. We're going to lock the bungee wheels. And then just rotate this down, and she's free to leave. Thanks. Some of the challenges with this machine, I can tell you, is if, if a patient is used to and progressing nicely while they're walking, so let's say you've got them going 20 feet, then you've got them 30 feet, then you've got them 50 feet. And once they get into this machine, walking without holding on here or without parallel bars is much easier than walking holding my hands. So as a result, patients will tell you, I don't like it. It's hard. And as a clinician, you're thinking, we were going 100 
feet with Mr. Mansfield, now we can barely walk 10. So, so what I'm asking you to think about is, think about less about how long you go and about ambulation and more about what you do during that period of time. So imagine a 10-foot ambulation that involves me walking backwards with my eyes closed a little bit, doing a high five, holding your hands, possibly marching with your hands out in front like this. It's a much different, much more functional and intense exercise. And as I said at the beginning, the evidence clearly is saying to improve outcomes, you have to train functionally and intense. But that's very difficult with people with movement disorders. It comes with a precaution card on the back, and I suggest you read it. Um, but a couple of things. First of all, patients who can't support their weight for 30 seconds to a minute shouldn't be in this. Severely weak ankles, we wouldn't put them in. Again, we would put them for severe ankle weakness, we would give them what we call an ankle trainer. And you can go on our website to look at that. But So the person has to support themselves with a walker for 30 seconds to a minute. Weak ankles is something you wouldn't want. Severe osteoporosis or bone abnormalities, you'd want to check with your physician. And, and also just being afraid of everything. People who are, uh, you know, kind of quite nervous and quite anxious. But, but you can convince them by having them watch somebody else being successful with the tool. So, for example, if they were sitting there watching me waltz with somebody or dance with somebody with music, they might get into it and might give it a try. So, in summary, the bungee mobility trainer, think of it as aquatherapy without the water um, and the ability to um, vary the buoyancy. Uh, it has great use in early, mo early mobility in acute rehab. So there's a great testimonial on our website about a woman who had bilateral knee replacements in Michigan. They were able to get her up and walking the next day um, in this machine, because remember, you can unweight them. So sub or acute rehab, all kinds of great applications for early mobility. You can see the applications for subacute rehab working on balance training, and also, of course, in long-term care for working on falls preventions. And some people have these in their homes. They work with their um, with someone at their home on various activities to work on balance training. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, our website is www.neurogymtech.com. Uh, on that website, you'll see testimonials, research papers, application notes, data sheets, videos, a lot of information. Or you could call us at any time. And please, as you start to use the machine and you do have some questions, call us. But also, if you have some success stories, we love to hear the success stories. Um, you could call, we have a toll free number, and it's 877. 523-4148, 877-523-4148, and I'll look forward to chatting with you hopefully in the future. Thanks very much.